Alright, so today is July 8th, 2011, and I am here with Alvin Lafreniere and Johnny Runberg. And I suppose um, we'll start with um, when your families first came to the island, so whoever wants to begin. Johnny. Uh, my great-grandfather, because of the great commercial fishing in the waters around Beaver Island, came from Mackinac Island, where they had immigrated, to uh, Whiskey Island, and they lived there, and uh, Joyce Bartels, who comes up with these gems every year from the State Archives in Lansing, uh, gave me information this spring that my great-grandfather, James McCann, his wife, uh, Mary, or Amy, I'm sorry, Kathy, lived on Whiskey Island with five of their children, and there were two single men that must have worked for them. They fished commercially, salted the fish in barrels. He was a cooper as a young man, and uh, the fish, in all likelihood, were brought by boat to Beaver Island to go on a schooner, because they were all sailing vessels then, to go down state, down lake, to uh, some other port, or maybe all the way to Chicago. Okay. But there was no refrigeration, so the fish were in the brine, or salted, in the, at the uh, production, or the consumer end, they had to be rinsed. I don't know a great deal about that. Do you, Al? They had to, must have had to rinse and rinse and rinse. Oh, with the, with the salt in the fish. They would have to be rinsed four or five times. Sure. To get the salt out. But uh, then we came here in later years and had a store around the harbor. It had been an old trading post owned by a man named James Dorman that had ships that went up and down the Great Lakes, and uh, my great-grandfather acquired that trading post from him, and then later had the store built that is now the community center, and he lived upstairs. And later, uh, Al's family, his grandfather, bought it, and his uncles ran the store, one in particular ran the store. And it moved on to another family and another one. So it's had several owners. And now it's uh, all that remains is the face of the building, uh, the metalwork. Save that, but the rest of the building had to be torn down. Uh, when he, when the great grandfather lived up there, his wife died in the early 50s, and her daughter and her, her father, the daughters, and her granddaughter moved up there to live with him. And, uh, when she died, again, the other young, the daughters were grown. His son, Mike, wanted him to move up to the house next to ours here, and he was stubborn and he wouldn't move. So that whole family moved down and lived up over the store. Okay. <laughs> so the mountain and the hot mountain. Mm -hmm. kind of <laughs> but I love the story about uh, him milking the cow. He went out to, uh, as he, when he was probably in his early 90s, he milked the cow and he came back in and the bucket was empty. And his daughter. Maybe Mary said, "Where's the milk from?" She said, "I gave it to the cow." So she went out to check the cow. And the cow was all white. The cow must have put her foot in the bucket, oh. took the bucket of milk, threw it on the cow. <laughs>
And you know, they didn't have a way to diagnose Alzheimer's or dementia. They didn't call it by those names. But uh, I've seen his death certificate and there was something in there that implied that he had to be treated. Okay. And he was in his late 90s. Close to and this is your great grandfather? Yes. Okay. And that was James. His son, John, was my grandfather. Okay. And the house we live in was his home. Oh, okay. And did he own a store or was he? He fished. He was fish. a commercial fisher. Okay. Great grandfather talked to him into coming from a wood building boatyard in Wyandotte near Detroit come up here and be the captain of the Hi. Hi, Nancy. Uh, of a uh, roughly 70 foot long uh, steam tub. Had a crew of about seven men. The fish were so oh. plentiful that they would string the nets out. I've, I've read and I've heard and told four or five miles one net onto the other. Today it's not true at all because of scarcity of the fish. Then uh, we had the introduction of the sea lamprey into the Great Lakes. Came in in ocean going vessels in their ballast water, which they took on in the ocean, in fact, on the uh, European side. It stabilized the vessel as it crossed the Atlantic. When they got into the Great Lakes, they pumped this ballast into the Great Lakes, thus introducing any number of uh, species that you would not want. So that's how the sea lamp got here. Probably they were found in the 1920s. They attack the lake trout, which are a smooth skin like a salmon, but eventually they even uh, preyed on the white fish. And, uh, the lamprey would attack the trout on their spawning beds, you know, like a snake, and yeah. kill them. That's what ruined the fishing industry. Pretty much, yeah. but overfishing by men like my great-grandfather, grandfather, and even uncles, uh, certainly led to taking the numbers down. That was probably even more so than the eel. You well, said that by 1938, the whole northern third of Lake Michigan was just one big fish net. Yeah. The entire northern third of the yes. lake was like one gigantic fish net. With the depression on, the market was being suppressed. They're getting less money for fish. So the idea was, well, we'll set more nets and catch more fish so we can sure, keep su sure. supply supporting our families. And the fish just couldn't keep catch, keep up at the same time that the eels came along. But the overfishing, primarily because of the, they were getting next to nothing. 1937, what my uncle, my grandfather were fishing, they were getting two cents a pound for white fish. Yes. Two cents a pound. So sure. you had to set a lot of extra nets. And they, my grandfather had 14 children, so he said a lot of that, so just as, as everyone sure. did, you know, to make up the difference. And they fished through the ice in the wintertime for perch, primarily. And they'd have a hole in the ice, and they'd push a pole to the next hole and pull the net across. Wow. There it would be under the ice. I did a little research one winter, about 22 years ago. And uh, I took the bill books out of the cases down in the Marine Museum and determined that there were approximately 65, maybe even 70 guys that were catching and selling perch on the market. These were bill books, little uh, ones that had uh, two copies, you know, they're carbon. When I was a boy, there was still lots of perch in the harbor. Today, there are virtually none. No one catches perch out there. 
But there are several reasons for that. I think. Didn't the weeds grow up in the harbor and the tubs weren't there anymore? I don't know. I was told that. There were, my mother said there were 33 commercial tubs when she was a girl. She was born in 1903. So, perhaps by 1915 or so, there were still that many. And you see the pictures of the Marine Museum of the many boats that there were. Every shape and size and description you can imagine. Yeah. There was one engine down there that they, well they took a, uh, was it a six or an eight cylinder, cut it in half, and raised the plate on the end. That was Charlie Martin did that. Yeah. I don't know what it was for. It was for his pound nets, maybe to... For lifting the weight to drive to the drive, to drive the, the pound nets. Yeah, the, the nets in, or the pound net into the ground. To pile them, to drive pile them another the ground. Okay. And that was Buddy Martin's father, who now you see the orange barge and the tugs around the harbor. Mm -hmm. That's Buddy yeah. Charlie's son. Yeah. Okay. But they all had big families. Yeah. I didn't know your grandfather had what, 14. Did you say? Yeah. So 14. when did um, your family, Alvin, get to the island? Uh, um, from my mother's side. Uh, her dad's name was Conahan, okay. and he was born, the Hugh Conahan, he was born down at Sand Bay where the Jordan River mm -hmm. uh, flows into right there. His dad had a, a grocery store there, and his name also was Hugh, and he came from Aaron Moore. Okay. And his, uh, my maternal grandmother uh, was a Malloy. She was born here on the island, and her parents came from Aaron Moore. So they arrived here maybe in the 1870s, and uh, they, most of them when they left Ireland, they went to Canada first, or some on the, on the East Coast, and, but so it was some time, they were in Canada, and then they got here about the 1870s, or the late 60s, and uh, they had a grocery store at Sand Bay, that would be my, my grandmother's part. Now, on my dad's side, his mother was a Boyle. <coughs> And her, she was born here. So three of my grandparents were born here, and her parents came from Aaron Moore, they, uh, off the area. So you're familiar with Aaron Moore, both of you. I know mm -hmm. Dr. Rockman right. has been there. Mm -hmm. So all three of my grandparents, relatives, all came from Aaron Moore. And uh, my grandfather Lafonaire, that my dad's dad, was born down by uh, Central Michigan, down by uh, north of Grand Rapids, by in Macosta County. But his parents came from Quebec. They were. Uh, my great grandfather was born two days horseback ride from Quebec City. <laughs> Quebec is so huge. That's how they measure distances by how many days horseback ride it took from one place. So there was no miles given. It was two ho two days horseback ride <laughs> from, wow. from Quebec City. <laughs> that's a lot of horseback riding. And so they were loggers, and they followed the logging industry. And uh, my great grandfather was, uh, they were an old family with no automobile agency in France, mm -hmm. aristocrat. And her, uh, her parents had arranged a marriage for her. That was done, that's the way it was done in French society. Well, she didn't like the guy that she was supposed to marry. She kind of fell for this lumberjack because he was a good dancer, I guess. So she wanted to marry him, and there's no, no way. So they had to leave Canada and go to the United States to get married. And he just followed the logging, and then uh, they logged it downstate Michigan. So my grandfather came over here across, he walked across the ice with his brother, Ernst, about 1904 to work for the Beaver Island Lumber Company. And that's how he got here, and he met up with my grandmother, who supplier Boyle, where the gift shop is now. She owned a store there. She, she sold, uh, uh, like bolts of cloth, women made their own dresses and everything for yarn, for knitting, for you know all, all that that kind of work, and hats, women's hats, and everything. The shoes she sold on that, and then uh, they married and then expanded and had the grocery store and and then he bought the King String Hotel later and uh, managed that. So that's how they got here to, to log, but from my and my dad's or my grandfather's side, on my mother's side, they he was a fisherman. 
so when he left farm as a young guy, or left up Sand Bay, where they farmed, had the grocery store, then he took up fishing. And it was a good job, good business, until the Depression, when the market just was so depressed. But he fished uh, well, all of his adult life. And, and his sons followed in that, and they fished. And they would catch huge amounts of fish during the Depression, but I just said, there was a receipt that was, he stayed up during World War II when my dad was gone to the Navy. My Uncle Lester kind of, who fished with my dad, stayed at my folks' house when my dad was gone to the war, you know. So he, and Father Dan, kind of, you met him? Mm -hmm. Okay, he, as his dad, his mother, and he stayed upstairs in their house. And my mother and my oldest sister Loretta and I were downstairs. I was 14 months old when Dad left for the war for the Navy. So they lived upstairs and fished. And years later, I found this receipt from the Booth Fisheries where he and Grandpa got two cents a pound oh. for white fish. Two cents a pound, that's all. And so they just kept putting out more and more nets and more and more nets. And but the more fish it was, it further depressed the price. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, my great grandfather was a fish buyer for Booth and then later for. I think it was U.S. fish or something like that, out of Chicago. Mm -hmm. So he would buy the other fish from catch, but the company in Chicago set the price, what they would pay. And the big long dock with the car for you know, all that was all wood. And uh, there was a nice house and a probably diesel-powered ice crusher and they would drag, well, first slide down a ramp as they took the layers of ice down in the ice house. And they'd slide out of the dock, and there was so much friction from the boards that the ice would shoot into the lake. And they'd drag it with a pair of tongs and break it into something they could lift, dump it in the ice crusher, and the ice would spew out uh, ice cube sized chunks onto a heavy steel plate and they had a looked like a coal shovel they'd scoop the ice up with the shovel and put a layer in these boxes that were made around the harbor at a mill because milk is milk and then the fish not clean in the round would go right into the box Today, what the fishermen at Rowan Harbor, uh, he dresses the fish, takes the image of So I don't think some of those fish not dressed, packaged in ice, shipped down lake to Chicago, uh, probably weren't real good fish. Well, in the later years, so in the, set, in the, in the 30s, they would ice them down here and put them on the ferry boat to Charlevoix, and yep. someone there would ice them down again. They'd go on the train, they go by rail then sure. to Chicago. So they would have been a bit fresher. But that's mm -hmm. still a long time before they get the fish to market. But my grandmother taught me, and I was getting fish from my uncle, or his mother, my grandmother. And uh, she always told me to check the eyes and see if there's glaze in there or if there's bright, because they're bright looking, alive looking, that was a fresh fish. Oh, okay. In other words, don't come home with an old fish. <laughs> but they did dress them right at the dock too, or coming in on the boat, they would dress them. But I think the early years they were in, in the round as they said, shipped that way. Well, when I gave a reference to my uncle and grandfather selling fish. That was to the Booth Fisheries. They sold it two cents a pound. It was in the round. Yeah. That's without them being the, the not in the round. Yeah. Yeah. Not in the round. Semi clean. But it was a hard life, and it was a dangerous life. Yeah. But when the fish were, when the price was a little better, the fish were very plentiful. In the 1920s, my grandfather would not set any nets in the summer. They would just fish 
in the spring and the fall. Yeah. And they would take the, literally take the summer off. And, uh, then in the wintertime, my grandmother and he would go over to Charleroi and stay in the apartment. Coming out. The house here had no insulation. And they burned coal in the big stove in the dining room, wood in the one in the kitchen. And, uh, it, was, it was not a very comfortable place to be in the cold weather. But I don't think anybody insulated houses until the 1940s. Well, nowhere, I don't, they didn't have insulation back then. Yeah. That. I'm sure they didn't. Nowhere in America, I'm sure it didn't, it didn't exist. One of the first things they did was in insulation industry, and they took newspaper, newsprint, shredded it, and then later they fireproofed it and sold it in great big bags. And, uh, that's what we put into our house up here. Okay. Yeah. Bored holes through the siding, through the sub. The boards underneath the side. Rented a machine from the mainland, and blew it in to the side walls all the way around, and then up in the attic. It, it was initially in there at least 20 inches deep, but of course it's seven. Mm -hmm. And it worked pretty darn good. But do you have what kind of insulation? You have fiberglass. Fiberglass. So it was constructed that way. Yeah. Um, one thing I was wondering about was um, for your families that came from Ireland to here, were there any like big changes that in like their social structure or just the way they lived here compared to on Ireland? Like, did they have make big adjustments? No, they probably that? wouldn't have been that. They, in Ireland, they were all Catholic, and the church was center to their life. When they got here, it was the same thing. They, uh, in, in the, when they were like in New York or Boston or in Canada, they were discriminated against. The Irish were co constantly discriminated against. In Boston, there would be signs in windows, help wanted, Irish need not apply. And signs on lawns, uh, dogs and Irish stay off the grass. So there was the great discrimination against the Irish. So when they got here, there was uh, only a handful of French, a handful of Germans, and probably 75% of the people were Irish. So they uh, they they were comfortable. Mm -hmm. They were their they own. They would fight with each other, but oh yeah, they comfortable. would fight with each other yeah. <laughs> all the time. But they had the Catholic Church that was the center of their social life, and house parties. They, there was no television. There was no radio there. And so house parties was on Saturday night someplace, a barn dance, or somebody had a good sized parlor in their home. The musicians would show up and then they would uh, play the music and sing and dance. And so they had that camaraderie, you know. So, uh, the, so, the, so it, if, well, then in, in Ireland they started, it was after the potato famine. Mm -hmm. And our people were put off there and more. Uh, it was sold, the whole island of there and more was sold. And I can't think of his name, but it's it's we have it in, in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, this uh, English lad, or he he was from Belfast, whatever. He purchased the island, and he wanted to reduce the population. There was two to six hundred people or whatever living there. He wanted to reduce the numbers greatly to rate growth, rate more sheep to sell you know sell the meat to England and the wool. So he imposed a tax. People who had to pay a property tax on with the land that they had, or they had to leave. So for most of the people that had to leave that, that came to Beaver Island, the tax would have amount to one dollar, and they they didn't have it, so they had they were evicted, and then they came on the coffin ships, you know what I mean by the yeah. the mm -hmm. sailing ships that uh, there was unsanitary conditions and next to nothing to eat, you know, whatever. And a lot of people died on the way over, and they were just throw their bodies over the side, you know, burial at sea, say a few prayers. So uh, when they got here, and Aaron Moore is a barren island. Did you go with Dr. Rotma when she went? We did not go to Aaron Moore. There's no trees or bushes. It's it's a barren, just rocks and grass, enough for the goats to eat and the sheep. That's about it. 
So when they got here, they had all the forests. They had farmland. They, uh, the Mormons had been here. They'd cleared the land. So they had the ready-made farms. Mormons were gone. So it was, it was like going from hell to heaven. The potato famine and the British oppression and uh, the lack of everything. And then here, the fish were plentiful, good farmland already cleared, timber, all kinds of firewood, and uh, bushes and flowers and everything that they didn't have in there anymore. So I would think it was it was like leaving hell and coming to heaven would have been about the way it, it would have looked to them. Mm-hmm. Plenty to eat. The lake was teeming with fish. And uh, in Ireland, they were they were starving. My mother said during the Depression, no, she was from a family, 14 children. And every now and then, her her dad or mother would get a letter from the relatives back in Ireland, on Aaron Moore, saying, could you please spare a dollar sent to us? If the Depression was bad in America, it was much worse in Ireland, much, much worse. And mother said that her mother and dad, they'd read the letter five or six times. And just didn't know how in the hell, you know, during the depression here with 14 children feet, how they could come up with an extra dollar. And, you know, the, the please, you know, our, the, the children did not even have shoes. And, you know, and it was so sad. But mother said there was no way that her mother and dad could even spare a dollar. When they go to the grocery store, my grandmother would count out. She knew the grocery bill would be $3.74. And she'd have to scrounge around the house the extra money and then she'd tell mother or one of the other the other girl we'll go up to the boys room some of the boys were older mm-hmm. they were fishing or whatever, and see it. and all the boards had cracks like that she, you know go up and look down through all the cracks see if one of the boys dropped a nickel they need another nickel to get whatever the groceries so the girls would comb through their older brother's bedroom and maybe they'd find the nickel or whatever to enough to to get the groceries for the day. So, well, the people came in through uh, Montreal, Canada, St. Lawrence Seaway, of course, later. They came in through the Port of New York and, and Philadelphia as well. And a few years ago, I was at a uh, RV reunion of a caravan that we went on to Alaska in 96. And, uh, there was a statue being made at the Colorado Art Castings at uh, Loveland, Colorado, and uh, it was a huge thing, oh, bigger than like two cars side by side in size, and it showed the immigration from Ireland because the, the statue was going to Philadelphia, and at the beginning. It was a panorama with a message. <coughs> the young man had been digging in the soil. His mother is standing there, and his hands are like this. No potatoes, nothing. And then it showed the people walking up around this statue, huge statue. And at the end, they're coming in through the gates at the Port of Entry in Philadelphia. And if were you to ever go there, you would see that statue that we saw being made. So it was a, a tribute to, uh, in memory of, the terrible famine that we saw. By the time my McCann relatives came to this country, the famine had passed. The potato blight that had mm-hmm. caused a great deal of the suffering in the famine was over. And uh, by 1852, they came in one of the coffin ships you referred to, and it was a vessel out of Liverpool, England, that stopped in Ireland. And uh, it was the uh, John M. Stewart. And I have a record of that, of the passenger manifest when my great-grandfather, who was just a child, he was 10 or 12 years old, and his parents came from the old country and uh, went to Mackinac Island. And uh, the great-grandmother, great-great-grandmother was uh, a Mary O'Malley, 
We used to say that uh, we were related to Grace O'Malley, the, the woman pirate from Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> not true. <laughs> uh, she married a John McCann that was my great great grandfather. And they were both, uh, are both buried in the St. Anne Cemetery at Mackinac. But then their son, James and Pat came to Whiskey Island and then to Beaver Island. Pat left he went up to uh, was a lighthouse keeper at Wagashan. So oh, lighthouse, the one that's out away from the shore. But, uh, but they fished because the fish were literally jumping into your nets. They were so fond of them. They would write, people from the island would write back to their relatives in Ireland and tell them about this wonderful place. And so uh, one of our Beaver Island journals for the historical society tells a tale that there were 17 Gallagher families on the island at the same time and they couldn't all trace most of them couldn't trace common answers because there were that many. So they all got thankful. There's a great tale in one of the journals about the nicknames. Really fun. The, the one about uh, the father and son, both named Phil. And, uh, the dad. It's called Big Phil, the son of Little Phil. The son grew to be bigger than the dad, and then the <laughs> little Big Phil and Big Little Phil. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so the names great. got pretty hilarious that people had up there. Mm -hmm. But I always remember that one. <laughs> That's really funny. Um, another question I was sort of wondering about was um, in light of like the booming fishing industry, I was wondering if any sort of know, class divisions were created, like between the different occupations, like were the fishermen sort of in a class of their own, or the fish buyers, or the merchants? Well, not that I know. There were the fishermen, the farmers, many of them German, mm -hmm. uh, south of town, and the loggers, I would say the logging has gone on well over a hundred years. Well, loggers primarily would come and go. They would. But those that fished and farmed, mm -hmm. you know, they, they were here generation after generation. But I don't, I never heard of any class divisions. There were friendly rivalries. I remember they, they would call the, uh, the farmers hayseeds and the farmers would call the fishermen uh, fish jokers. Yeah, now see, even yet, on St. Patrick's Day, they always, right here in town, that's what they have the big festivities. Well, the Saturday w of weekend before St. Patrick's Day, the big celebration would always be on the Saturday, either right after St. Patrick's Day or before. But they'd have a lot of activities here in town, and the one is the rope pull contest between the hayseeds and the fish children. <laughs> so it's boiled down. I mean, there was never, I mean, you know, our didn't bloodshed or anything like that, right. but it was more or less, you know, a hay seeder or a fish choker. In the sure. but it come down now. They have right here in front of the Shamrock. They have that. I don't know if you have, well, if you well, I got copies of the beacons at home in Northern Ireland. It would show them, and it's that's what they call the the people from the Payne Township out that would be on the one side. The people in town, even though nobody fishes anymore, <laughs> I mean, just skip the ammo, but. They would, they still get on there, and they then the people come from the mainland for the weekend. They would, you know, come over here, you come over. So people who nev didn't farm nor fish, nor, you know, they would pick sides on one side or the other. So it's all just friendly rivalry. Okay. Whether there was any fistical encounters back in the years ago over the fish, I don't think so, because the the farmers out there grew everything they grew. They had a ready market here in town. There was hundreds of people here in town. And not everyone fished. There was carpenters, people building houses. There was, you know, whatever people working the sawmills, the loggers, whatever. But the farmers would sell everything here in town that they raised. They would grow extra sheep and cattle to be shipped off to the mainland. But 
they're all their, their produce, all their vegetables, their, their eggs, their, you know, potato, everything. And the uh, chickens they raised and the hogs could all be sold here in town. And uh, so uh, it was, that was their customer. So I doubt very much if there was friction or fighting or animosity. Oh, there's bound to be there a, were a bar fight, there you were know, individual guys getting drunk uh, in the bar and getting into a fistical encounter, you know, there'd be, uh, there'd be a few cases here or there, sure. but as far as fishermen uh, warring with the, you know, with the fishermen uh, far back and forth, and uh, farmers come into town, buy the fish and these stuff, and my uh, my grandfather, the uh, grandfather Lafayette, who came to work for the lumber company later when he married my grandmother, What's now uh, the gift shop there, they expanded that into a, a grocery store. And all the women out in the country would always make their own butter. They'd have their milk, and they'd make butter, and they keep what they want. They'd bring the rest in to sell it at his grocery store, and bring eggs in and, you know, whatever. And there was our, we had our own meat market here. Be my, uh, my grandmother's brother and her dad had a meat market that's down... Uh, what's now called uh, out on, or Whimsy, mm -hmm. that, store, that, that was the meat market. And uh, that's where my, uh, my grandmother's dad first, uh, his name was Lawrence Malloy, and he got the meat there, and then his son, Lawrence Jr., uh, got the meat there. So the farmers would bring sheep in, they'd shear the sheep and bring sheep in, check everything, you know, the, uh, the beef, you know, whatever to sell there. And he, he had the meat market there. And uh, so then, they were, and then on my mother's dad and her brothers were fishermen, all of them. Uh, so that whole end of the family, after Grandpa got out of the logging, and then on the, his mother's side, my dad's mother, with a boil, they were fishermen. I mean, they were farmers. Me. They lived out in the country. They were all farmers. The Boyles were farmers, and the Malloys and Cunahans were fishermen. And then my grandfather was caught in the clink. Wow. <laughs> but well, he was a logger, and then he ended up being a grocer. So you had carpenters, you had masons, you had every, you know, every. So not everyone was a fisherman, but uh, the farmers all had a ready market for whatever they would grow here. So it was. Uh, then the, the church was, uh, was the center of everything, and the social activities that went with the church. And then you had your uh, your house parties. You know, and then, then there was the. Uh, the drinking, you know, we'll go with that. Well, Barry Fisher would sing a song, they drank from the jar. <laughs> That'd be moonshine back in those days. Right. When there Gus Snoke had his mill, uh, there was, he was German, and there was the Fishners, the Ellers, the Snokies, there were others, and they had a German band. And there's a picture in the back of the print shop where the logging display is, and you'll see that picture. In there. I'm pretty sure that's where I saw it. Most recently. And they had their own brass instruments. It made a horrendous sound, I guess. There were baseball games uh, when I was a little kid over at the Ball Diamond. It wasn't softball, it was slow pitch stuff. It's, to me, it's not even a sport, but they played hardball. Baseball, regular and baseball. there were at least two teams, and uh, the Coast Guard, your dad was in the Coast Guard. Coast Guards played, uh, guys from town, uh, two of the Cornstalk boys, they were Indian, one was a pitcher, one was a catcher, and they were pretty good sized strapping young men, they, could, they were good athletes. Still the ball down in there, but the slow pitch that they play over the Fourth of July is well. Back then, Dad said, "Well, first his dad, yours, his dad was um, the baseball team they had back in there when they still had the B Royal Lumber Company. And his dad was the catcher, and they would go on fish tugs to play other teams on the mainland. And then when Dad got old enough to play, it was the same thing. They would leave here on." And Willie John Gallagher, he owned the house at the end of the street next to the parish hall. He was the the manager of the team, and he had a, the, he'd have a couple, three fish tugs lined up that the guys were going to take out. So he would go around and, and make sure all the guys who were going to play ball had to get down and sleep on the fish tug. He'd have them down there about 10 o'clock Saturday night. Well, my dad was a 10 bar at the Shamrock. His dad owned the Shamrock. 
he began on bar and Willie John would go and sit there, make sure he didn't take a drink. And as soon as the bar closed, the dad cleaned up the bar right down and I'm the first I couldn't go home for nothing. Uh, whatever you had, you know, you had to have it with it. They would, so he had them all on there so they would be out drinking and partying. And then they'd leave about six in the morning. Like do they go to Mackinac Island or they go to into Harbor Springs. That was a short route, but Mackinac Island they had to leave real early. And get up there and there'd always be people there to meet them, take them to church and then uh, something to eat and right to the ballpark. They'd play a double header and then uh and, and back again. But that was the longest run I think they made was to Mackinac Island. That's that's and those fish tugs weren't very fast. So it was a long day to go and play a double header over there. Or they'd go into Charlevoix and, and play there, you know, which is not that long of a run. But he said the one game I'll never forget this. They went to Mackinac Island the one time and their pitcher was a one armed pitcher. And the island guys had there was uh you know, one of the Wasagis, it's uh, Alex. Alex Wasagisic sure. was their pitcher. He said it was, it was Alex Wasagisic was the pitcher, and he was good. And they went that game went full nine innings, and the Islanders, our guys won one to nothing nice. against that <laughs> one-armed pitcher. And I'll, I'll never forget him telling. That's the only thing I remember of all the games he played, and he missed some things about different games. Sure, that sticks out in my mind because sure. that one-armed pitcher. Mackinac Island, and our pitcher was an, an Indian lad out and was born on High Island, and he was very good. And so our guys, they won one to nothing on the nine innings. Uh, and that's what sticks in my mind about them pitching there. Wow. And uh, before that, his grandfather played on the previous team, and he was a catcher, and, and, was, and he was good. So, But see, they were that then. My grandfather was a logger, and my dad was in the Coast Guard and had logged with his dad. And then the Coast Guard, so they were all prim fit, you know. And the fishermen, that's hard work. So all the guys, uh, they were athletically, you know, if they wanted to put their mind to athletics, they had the physique for it. They they worked hard, you know. From, so they had the uh, they had the strength. They had the you know, and they always Beaver Island always put put out a good baseball team, and still do. <laughs> but it was a a big deal the Sunday baseball games over here at the Diamond because. Uh, didn't have movies, television, other activities here, and uh, so the crowd really turned out. Mm -hmm. A lot of people would be over mm -hmm. watching the game. Growing up, did you, like, you live mostly in town, or did you, did you both, or? And I was just wondering, like, how often you were able to, like, see people from the coast. John was a city slicker. He only lived here one full year. One winter he was oh, a student. Okay. Just the one year. Okay. That's not so. You only went one, you went one year to school, didn't you? Not more than that. Well, I thought you said just Came one year. Came here when I was six years old. And when I was about 13 or 14, my parents moved to Bay City. Well, I thought you only went over here one full winter. No, no, okay. Mm. No. And then when my grandmother was who was a widow, wanted to stay uh, late in the fall and come early in the spring. I would go to school down in Bay City seven months, two months up here. <laughs> would that be the school right in town or which school? Yeah, the, well that the old that school was way just a they were square box. They were tore down the schools at the United like Sunnyside or No, that Rosa? Sunnyside no, no, they were out, out. They were out in the in the country. Country, oh, okay. Yeah, the, right where the present school is. Oh, that there was, was right. older school. The school I went to was the McKinley School. Is that the school yes. you went to? Yes. Okay. Named after President Two McKinley. Two-story square box, and there were schools uh, all over the nation named McKinley School for President McKinley. They yep. renamed uh, Mount Denali. Denali National Park in Alaska, Mount McKinley. And I referred to that after we'd been in that caravan and uh, Rudy or Ruth Denny said, it's Mount Denali. <laughs> Real <laughs> emphatic about it. And she was right. She was a geologist by training. Then that school, uh, they quit used that whole about 1960 or so, and in about 63 or 64, it was torn down the McKinley School, and then they kept expanding the present school, 
and uh, what's up there now. But all that was torn down about three years ago. And what you see now is all brand new, with the exception of the gymnasium. But that's all new. So schools in that I went to were throwing the dumpster a long time ago. <laughs> but McKinley, or uh, not McKinley, Sunnyside was a great school for the kids that lived south of town. Okay. When they came into high school, they came downtown. Okay. And the high school was a little more than a lean-to on the Holy Cross Hall. What's now the kitchen of the Holy Cross Hall? Yeah. That, that was the high school for a lot of years. So but uh, the, 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 or the uh, Sunnyside School, if you've been out where the car wash and laundromat is, mm -hmm. on the other side of that is like that spin operation, carry concrete. That, that, that building, that's the Sunnyside School. Then if you went south to the end of the blacktop, to Macaulay Road, right there was a little right at the intersection. school called Roosevelt School, okay. and that's been a private home for 40, 50 years. Long time. Yeah. And for Sunnyside and Roosevelt, those were just the kids who lived in the, in the country. Yeah, mm -hmm. and okay. then bit by bit, there'd be, well, so fishing went down the tubes, the farmers, their market was gone, so they all started, well, with World War II, there wasn't much employment here, you know, uh, fishing was on the decline, so World War II, either the young guys were in the service, or other people and the girls went away to work in the factories. So then, by the time the war was over, the fishing was really gone, so there wasn't even any reason for the farm lads to stay. So World War II made that a big difference, so when the guys came back from the service, they were hung around for a few months or whatever. Get for, and then they have had it down to get jobs downstate too. This work was really opening up by then, you know, in Chicago and Detroit, and, or they were sailing on the ore boats. But uh, the, there was just an exodus off the island. Yeah, farmers and even during yeah. the war. So farmers went down the lakes, sailed on the lakes on the on the big boats. So the Roosevelt the School, boats. I think, 1942 was the last year for that school. That's the one where the King's Highway intersects with Macaulay Road, that, and it's still there, that building is still there. It's a private home now, seldom or used anymore. But that closed in 42, and then the Roosevelt, or the Sunnyside School, about 10 years later, 10 or 11 years later, that closed, maybe 53, maybe. Because there just wasn't, there wasn't any point in it. They only had maybe 15 students at the most, or maybe not even that many. So they just started coming into town. When the early 1900s, or early part of the 19th century, or say 1905 to 1930, the, the economy boomed within itself, and there were two dairies here. And the milk, of course, was not pasteurized. For that and other reasons, uh, tuberculosis was a health concern. And there were at least one, maybe two families that the uh, tuberculosis went through like a plague and killed many of the people. Now, raw milk would, would contribute to tuberculosis? It could. It could be a factor. Long time ago. And I think one of my grandfather's brothers, James, uh, contracted it. And he was the one that my great-grandfather had groomed to be the businessman of the grocery store and the fish buying business. And they sent him, he was 20 years old, to Denver to try to recover his health. That was a common thing that you could uh, recover from TB, higher altitude. But he died out there. He didn't. He's buried in the Holy Cross Cemetery. Well, we can both Thank think you. of one particular family that tuberculosis was rampant. Anyone actually had a question about logging? And maybe you could help out. I was wondering. I have a couple questions. One is with your grandfather, you mentioned that he was involved in logging and then he 
transitioned into the business in the grocery store. Why did he make that transition? Why did he stop logging? Well, uh, the Beaver Island Lumber Company left in 1915. Okay. But when he married my grandmother, she already had the business here. Okay. She had what's now the gift shop right next door. Uh -huh. right, right. And that, uh, that, as I said, she sold uh, bolts of cloth and everything for sewing. And so when they then they got married, well, they started raising the children right away. So she was home, and the house that they lived in was right was right the building right next door to Shamrock. And so it was that house there, that's where they lived. no first that's right they lived upstairs over over the, the gift shop. Mm -hmm. Now the gift shop they lived upstairs there first. That's where my dad was born. Well, she was starting to have children and the store was sitting there, and there's no not a lot of money in logging. You know, they were getting two dollars a day or whatever to log. So he took over that and turned it into a general store. And then after he made money, started making a little money, then he hired his own crews in the winter to log. Then he became the, I want to say the head honcho, and he would have uh, guys log for him all winter long. And my dad quit school when, he, in the tenth grade, when he was 16, to walk down to join his dad at the logging camp. Grandpa would go down and do the log and supervise in the winter months, and then he'd have somebody else run the store. Uh, the lady, Easter Grace Cole, who lived in that house there, she would run the store for him. That was uh, my grandmother's first cousin. So she would work at the store while he was down watching the log and operation. You know. mm -hmm. Or he'd have another one of my grandmother's right. relatives you know, take care. Yeah. So anyway, Dad could school walk, walk down and, and log for him. So he would have that up. So he didn't really get out of logging entirely. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but uh, so he, he got into a lot of things. And when you live on Beaver Island, you have to get involved in a lot of things to make ends meet. Mm -hmm. Not very many people would do just the one thing. The fishermen would go logging in the winter time. The farmers would be logging in the winter time, and you know whatever to make ends meet. Or you were a carpenter. Mm -hmm. In later years, when there was electricity. A lot of the farmers would take up electricity, and when they, in the winter months, when they were well, done with their harvest and all that, then they would do their wiring or, take, they, you didn't have drywall back then. You, you probably had seen an old house being torn down, all the, the wooden lath, the little, you know, a million wooden laths and a million of those little nails, and you made your own plaster and spread it up there because they didn't have the drywall. And that so was some a guys maybe would be, good, maybe a fisherman would be good at that or a, a farmer. So you would do that. You know, plastering whatever. was a skill. Hmm? I say plastering was a sure. real skill. Yeah. You had to have a really good eye to get that plaster mm -hmm. straight. Mm -hmm. We took, my son's a drywall contractor, and he does other things. But we had him cover the old plaster with thin drywall on all the downstairs, up both stairways, down the hallway. We didn't have the bedroom. They're just wallpaper, but that covers up all that old cracked plaster over the many years. But you know, you were talking about them doing different things, different seasons. Uh, it was extremely hard to make it. And in the Martin family, my grandmother's family, that lived away down the Lower East Side, where Martin Bluff is, um, they fished in the spring and the fall, they farmed in the summer, and they cut cedar logs in the winter. And the whole southern third or more of Beaver Island is wetlands in over the King's Highway stops. It's all wet all the way to the south end. So when, when the wet areas froze over, they could get to the cedar logs of the trees, which grow extremely well in the wetlands. So it was pretty interesting when I was told that about Martin's and three different occupations. Well, then a lot of the farmers, uh, everyone burned, well, most people burned wood. Which they, there were some people, it was coal we brought over. The, the train, the railroad, for whatever reason, I don't know why they didn't burn wood, because they had plenty of it to burn. But they brought coal over. Well, then other coal would be brought. Some people used it in their wood stove. Coast Guard Station all had they had a coal furnace, and some other people had coal furnaces rather than wood. 
but most homeowners burn wood. Well, in the winter time, your farmers, most of them would have the, the heavy, the long, heavy sleds, called the bobsleds, mm -hmm. and they go with a team of horses. Three or four of them would go out on, on a day, and they would cut their own firewood for themselves for the following winter, and then they would cut an enormous amount of wood to sell to other people on the island. They'd come into town, people who didn't have horses or sleds, to sell them their firewood. So that was another way they would make uh, a living. And some of the people who fished, like the O'Donnells, lived the, the, the family home was the one right next to the school, mm -hmm. where uh, Mary and Edward Palmer lived now. Mary's mother was an O'Donnell, and that was her grandparents home. Well, he had Willie, the, in fact, they called him Willie the Woodchopper. He was a fisherman yeah. by trade, but all winter long, he had horses, he had a farm behind there, and he would go out and cut firewood to sell to people in town. So uh, not many people had one occupation. And you had to, be, uh, you know, you had to take up other things because there was no unemployment, and uh, you know when you weren't pulling in nets with fish, or when you couldn't sell any sweet corn in February, you had to come up with another way to make money because there was no, no such thing as uh, welfare or, uh, or there unemployment. No safety nets. Mm -hmm. No. As we have today. You worked or you went without. You know. But when you, if you were to go in the Marine Museum. You would see on the display of the fishing fleet a number of boats that had a big black smokestack. Those were all coal burners. So since there were six or seven steam steam uh, engine powered tugs, the uh, a vessel would bring the coal in and set it big piles on the docks. And because my great grandfather owned the dock and the coal was his to sell. His sons, my uncle and my grandfather, they would bring coal home and you would burn wood in the big square wood stove through the day, but at night you'd put a chunk of coal in there to tide you overnight. So you'd get up in the morning and hit it with the poker and it would break open you throw some fresh supply of wood, but 90% of what you burned was wood, which was inexhaustible supply. Readily available. <laughs> yeah. Now, when the Beaver Island Logging Company came and logging sort of took off, did it? It's just sort of a multi faceted question, but did they? Did it change land use on the island a lot once the logging company was here? And did it change sort of the identity of some of the people who took on logging and anything? I don't really know. Uh, most of the people that logged came from the mainland. Uh -huh. There was uh, the work for that lumber. There was a few local people. Right. But there, they needed an awful lot of people to work for that logging company, and they would have had to use every single person on the island fisherman farmer if they were to do that so most of the people that logged came from the mainland and some stayed for five or six years some only two years some remained on and married and just stayed a few but I don't there wasn't a whole lot of native born island working I don't think where they were they generally not everybody did everybody was knowledge, fishing right? and farming uh, now they might go out in the winter maybe and log a little bit you know it's like it's midwinter but uh, a farmer couldn't hardly justify working for 75 cents a day or whatever they were getting when and not not farm, you know, so. Imagine when they brought the trains in by ship and they, the mill that belonged to the Beaver Island Lumber Company, later Gus Milky's mill, they, the tracks before the last blacktop job, you could still see depressions in the old blacktop where the rails had come across the road uh, at Anderson's Marina, just between there and the McDonough store. So the rails went down back of town, went through the Heritage Park area where we were setting up a simulated rail bed today. Down the west side of the island, behind Barney's Lake, and you can still walk back there and find spikes. And I suppose there would be some 
friends who would learn it there. But one of my grandsons years ago, he, he found a half a uh, shoebox full of spikes. And they weren't very big. But the rails, they went further south, further south as they logged. And they had small schools. They would build a rude building must have provided teachers, or they hired islanders to teach school to the children of, of the loggers. And uh, anyway, they went further and further south, and when they were done cutting over, and the lumber company had bought huge acreage, particularly on the west side where the hardwood tends to be. Uh, but then when they were done, they pulled the spikes took the rails on flatbeds as it retreated northward, leaving the ties behind in the sand. And that's why we, for so many years, could find spikes. And down near Camp 3 Trail, uh, there was, what, a big chunk of rail stuck, yeah, uh, buried in the soil? When, when the lumber company, when they left, they tore up all the rails. They took the rails with them, unless there was some that were bent a little bit. Then they would just throw them off to the side. But all the, the spikes, they're all in perfect condition, but they didn't take them. They just threw them all off to the side. I don't know why. They sell these, all the rails, except, I say, the ones that were bent a little bit. They would, you know, some guy bend one, they'd pry them up. And th they'd leave them, but the, all the spikes were in perfect condition. Yes. And th but they just threw them off to the side, and they were so. Uh, and we were dunging out our dad's garage here a couple of weeks ago, and he had a whole box of them railroad spikes, a whole box of them. Yeah. But surprising, they're only about that long. I thought a railroad spike would be real long, but and the rails are about like, so they'd only go about an inch and a half or so into the wood. It didn't seem, but they knew what they were doing. I That's guess. That's probably why the, they had the train wreck. I don't know, but all, but all, well, you know how short they were. They weren't that, not all that long, but, yeah. uh, they, so, uh, how many islanders, I don't know, like I said, my paternal grandfather came over to work for the lumber company, so he did, and, uh, some of his brothers and his dad came to work, and some of his cousins, so they ended up, a lot of them over here, and, of course, my grandfather was one of the loggers that stayed, and then, uh, his brother, Archie, married a, a local girl, or girl from Garden Island, I guess, and he stayed for a while, then he moved down to Ann Arbor later, in later years. But uh, some of them stayed, but most of the people that came to work for the logging industry, logging, they, most of them left. Some stayed on and did some farming and whatever, but most of them left in later years. They only worked for a few years left, but uh, most of the island people had done up to work as it, as it was. Uh, some went to work for the logging company, but not a whole lot, no, not a whole lot. A few of the salmon birds did. Now, some, they may have worked in the wintertime. Not my ma maternal grandfather, Hugh Cunahan, who was the f course of fisherman. Mm -hmm. Now, when he was fishing, he worked at the sawmill, which is only a couple blocks from his house, where the Beaver Island Marina is now. Not the municipal marina, the first one, but the one at the other end, down by McDonald's, that marina. There was a sawmill there. And where my grandparents' house was was just about two blocks away. So they, uh, anyway, he, when he wasn't out on the lake, he would work at the sawmill. So he had different ways to make a living, you know, so. And, uh, so, and he worked for Gus Milky, who was German, and, and he was Protestant. But there didn't seem to be any rivalry either. The religious rivalry didn't seem to be. My grandmother was, well, her, she was, was Irish, Malloy, and from Aramore, and she would never voted, would never register to vote, didn't believe in voting. But Grandpa come home the one time and said that Gus, the Gus Melky that he was working at on the sawmill, was running for the school board, wanted to get on the school board, and it's going to be a close election. And he said, uh, Kate, he said, Gus needs your vote. So she went and registered, and she went and voted. The only time she ever voted in her life was for Gus Melky for the school board, and that, then she never voted again. But so uh, and he so th there couldn't have been any in, and most of the people Protestants were married Catholic girls and the Catholic girls married Protestant guys whatever so there didn't seem to be that right but, yeah, there didn't seem to be that at all either. But. Was there any animosity when your um, 
French side of your family first came to the island? Like, to an island of mostly Irish Some, people? Some, yeah. Good. Well, when they first came, they weren't Catholic. They had, uh, they were, they came over like in 1640s or 1630s, and for a hundred years they never saw a Catholic priest, so, you know, whatever, they kind of fallen away. So there was that little bit brief animosity, but then when they all started marrying the Catholic girls right here, then they turned Catholic and then all that ended too. You know, yeah. Well, and then my grandfather's name was uh, Narcosis up in there. And the, what the hell is that? So he changed it to Nels, simplified it. And his dad came also, his dad was born in Quebec, two days horseback right, Quebec City. So when he got his name was Narcosis, which would be common in France, I guess, or in Quebec, but on Beaver Island it didn't gel, <laughs> so they both became Nels. So well, there was a, a French family here, the name was Brian, B-R-I-E-N or N-E, uh, at any rate, uh, they changed it to O'Brien, and that's... Old Wilfred? Yeah. Well, I didn't know that. They I were French. They weren't Irish. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Wolford. Yeah, you Wolford changed Wolford. it. Put an O in front of it, you're all set. <laughs> <laughs> or a mech. I'm going to use the bathroom. I'll be right back. Speaking of folks coming from outside of the Irish community, like the French, did you do you know if there was how the folks who had lived here for a long time, how they perceived the influx of people from the mainland from the logging company, did they treat them differently? I don't know. Maybe they got along. Well, I said some of them were only here for a few years. True. And uh, I don't I, I don't think there was any any much in the mouse you didn't hear of it because it's the next income to what all those loggers they had to eat. So they ate the grocery you know, what the farmers grew with the more fish that the fishermen caught. So the sales were there, and some people, such as my grandfather, worked at the sawmill from time to time when he wasn't fishing. So, and uh, so, but I, I don't, I don't know if there was not that I know. Of, you know. But then I was born much later, so, but I, I never heard anything of it. So, mm -hmm. so I didn't. But it was in, in the Depression, what I was told, there wasn't any money to speak of circulating around. Right. Actually, no money. But no one went hungry. Everyone ate. And if someone was injured, like a guy roofing and fell off and would break his arm, or a logger and logged him down and he did a broke and pressed leg, couldn't work for a few months, everyone else on the island would cut their firewood for them, bring their fish, bring them. Prados bring the potatoes, and uh, they never went hungry. They would always be someone providing, you know, whatever they needed. And then when that person healed up and got better, someone else needed help in hand, and you know, you, you were expected to pitch in and help out. But during the depression, uh, I, I don't know my dad said his, his father, his dad owned the Shamrock, and then during the depression there was practically no money around in the winter time. So. Uh, New Year's Eve was the last day the bar would be open, the Shamrock, and then Grandpa would close and because there was no money, and then he'd open up again, St. Patrick's Day. And Dad said at daylight on St. Patrick's Day, there were a lot of Native Americans lived over on High Island, and they were noted, there was a lot of maple trees there. They were noted for all the maple syrup and maple sugar they would make. And Dad said at daylight, you could see all the Indians coming off High Island, coming over here, and they would have their uh, syrup, they would go door to door, and the sugar. The sugar would sell a little cube, about that, about that like that, for 10 cents. But the people here couldn't afford to buy that. So they would go to door to door and sell their maple sugar, so they'd have money to celebrate St. Patrick's Day. But the sugar they would drop off to Grandpa at his store, and he would save it in the summertime, and the tourists coming in the summer months, would, they'd have the 10 cents to buy the, the maple sugar. So they would do it that way. And a lot of the Native American women made uh, baskets. Uh, no calories like in there, They would make it out of woven uh, pieces of wood. 
practical baskets. There, there right. might be a no few small boxes in there, but they would make no bigger no. baskets. All the women here on the island that have them put their sewing stuff in, you know, their their yarn and everything, or they'd be laundry baskets that they, they would make. They would bring them over and go door to door to sell them. <coughs> so all those Native Americans would have some relatives here. They'd have cousins or somebody. And they would stay for a few days, and then they'd go to Grandpa's store and leave their sugar with him, and then they would get whatever they needed, pots, pans, and uh, salt, you know, whatever they needed to take back, bolts of cloth, and, and uh, you know, whatever they would need for their batteries for their radio. There was no electricity in the island until 1939. So people had battery-powered radios, and an awful lot of the room, probably about 20% of what was in Grandpa's store, shelf space, was batteries. Oh, wow. Once people got radios, that was, boy, that was the big thing. So they all, everyone had a radio. Well, you had to have batteries to go with it, and they weren't recharging the batteries, apparently. Well, you didn't have any electricity to recharge them anyway, but they'd last a long time. But uh, Anyway, they sell the batteries, but all the Native Americans, no, we still, and in, in here, there will be Birch Park baskets, have you gone through this? Yeah. Birch Park baskets in the Native room. Now, see, that was from the Indians from High Island. And my dad told me time and time again, you know, about the Indians, how all they grow, make an awful lot of maple syrup and sugar over there, and go over here and sell it. And about the women making their baskets, they would go around from door to door to the local women here, and our women would buy the practical baskets, just, you know, the plain baskets because for putting their clothes in or their knitting or whatever and so on and stuff. Then they would make fa ones, fancy ones with bead, bead work on all kinds of bead work, but none of the women here could afford them. So in the summertime, if you've been past the King Strang Hotel down there, in the summer the Indians would come over on the weekends and they would sit out there Friday, Saturday, and Sunday on that porch, and so that would be a bazaar. They would sell their, their baskets to the tourists, the, the, the fancy ones, because you know, the island women couldn't afford the fancy beaded ones. They would just have their practical baskets, you know, put stuff in. But uh, when I saw that in there, the, the basket, oh well, yeah, that's what Dad was talking about, and you know, that's that was how, what they would make out of birch bark. They didn't buy buckets like today. They made them out of birch bark, and they didn't leak. And that's how they would carry their water, their drinking water, out of a river, a creek, or out of the lake, you know, out of the practical birch bark baskets. Yeah, and it's so, it's, uh, life was, it was hard. You had a, you know, no unemployment. There was no, no unemployment, no Social Security, no nothing of that sort. So you uh, worked, and then when you got old, if you were nice to people all the way up, <laughs> they'd take care of you when you're old and on your way down. Well, so one, of, one of the stories about there was relief, it was called, and it was a sort of a welfare, and it was a government program administered by the county, and there's a story, and I won't name the family. Is that what Lorraine was saying about the old days, pension check comes to your door? Is that it? Well, this, but this was relief. This was, yeah. this was emergency aid or when welfare. Was when was this around? In the, probably in the 30s. Okay if not in the late 20s, and the story goes, without name and name, and the man, let's see, the old man died, and they put him in the root cellar until spring, because the ground was too hard to dig a grave, at least that was the story. Then the man came from the county or the state to do a head count on the family, and one of the sons was quite homely, and he had cauliflower ears, he looked like a prize fighter that never won a fight. So they put him in bed and passed him off as his father. Do you know who I'm talking about? Yeah, I heard that same story. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's only a story. His picture still hanging on the wall at the beach corner. <laughs> But the travel was very difficult here. Uh, on the east side of the island, when you get south of town about uh, oh, four or five miles, there's a two-track road in by the cottages that meanders. Have you ever seen that? You know, you've got the straight road down the east side, and then between that road 
in the water or the cottages are, mm -hmm. is this road that's up and down the hill and around. Yeah. That was the island road. That was the old road, yeah, the original in, road. In the 30s, certainly. Um, but my uncle had an old uh, Ford that he bought from the Bundys, and it had Isenglass windows that you had to snap in or fasten some way. But he would drive it with the top down, and no side windows in the summer. Uh, but that thing would just putt, putt, putt. Sometimes thought it wasn't going to make it over the next hill. Uh, when the lighthouse keepers, of which there were two, John Andy Gallagher, who lived around the harbor, and Bert McDonough, whose place was across the street from the rectory, the Catholic rectory, uh, they would stay down for two weeks at a time at the lighthouse at the south end, which has living quarters. No, there are apartments in there. There were several that years ago, 40, 50 years ago. So uh, a trip from the south end of town was a very long journey, difficult journey. Wintertime, it must have been next to impossible. Uh, Dan Turner had a double runner sleigh that he used out uh, on some slop town road. It's a road that goes into Barney's Lake, where his farm is right there. It's, it's the one that had the beautiful uh, lilac bushes that were about 100 feet in lilac. That was his farm. And when he was coming into town, and I had to go to the store, and if I happened to spot him coming, he'd slow down and jump on the back of the sleigh and get a ride downtown. Didn't always get a ride back when I had a load to get. But that, just just traveling the island was, was difficult. So did you mostly like interact with people in town? Yes. Oh, okay. Because the transportation is so hard. But the Catholic Church was where the Catholic cemetery is. And during Lent, you had services for the two or three nights a week. It be a Lenten services. Uh, Monday and Friday? No, no, Wednesday and Friday. When I was here, it was Wednesday and Friday, and then again you'd have Sunday afternoon. Yeah. Church Sunday morning, and then again two o'clock in the afternoon. But that was a walk. You can go up and jump in the car. And walk. So, but my cousin Bob McCann lived all the way around the harbor, just before the last house before you get to that Quonset hut by the water, and uh, he had a big uh, black dog could pull a sleigh. Dog was powerful. And he would, with that steel runner wooden sleigh, he'd ride with the dog's pulling all the way out to the church. And if I heard the dog barking, I knew he was coming. I'd hustle out. He'd slow down enough for me to jump on well, the for sleigh. Us, yeah. I would pull two of them. For us kids, going to those devotions on Friday night or Wednesday night, Friday night yeah. when we were in grade school, or early high school, that was that was a social event. That was a big all the kids <laughs> in town, you know, we'd snowball fight all the way up, yeah. then pray, then snowball ball, wash the girls' faces and ice. Oh god, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> but we did that around the school, of course, that we go inside then you then nuns would give you good lick and the, the <laughs> girls go in, you know, at when at school if you get caught, you get punished. But on at night, you know, going up back to church, oh god, we get a snowball fights and and, uh, so it was a fun. That was part of the social, you know, bit of uh, the, the play. You know, the all the way up, all the way down, and then do the do the do the devotions. A large and number of the nuns came from island families. One of my mother's first cousins they were, I think, the Malloy family. There were four sisters uh -huh. that all went into the Dominican order. Because the Dominican nuns taught here, it generated 
a huge number of locations. Uh, one of my first cousin on the guy who had the dog in the sleigh uh, became a Dominican priest. And, uh, his picture's in the back of the church. Your own, Father Jerome. Uh, so it, it had a big effect. The, one of the Coast Guard families, the Pop family, lived back of the Bull Diamond. They had a house full of kids. And uh, one of the sisters, older sister, that I didn't know until she was teaching as a nun. And this was on the second story of the school. And I saw this happen more than once. If somebody's down an aisle talking, and they should be paying attention, and the blackboard is behind her, and she'd reach back and get a hold of a, a eraser. And she didn't always hit the one she was aiming at. <laughs> she let fly with an eraser to get your attention. <laughs> Sister Gen the pop gal. Genevieve? No. No, Genevieve was later. Yeah. Sister Marie Genevieve, well not she was the principal when I was in seventh, eighth grade sure. and her ninth grade. So what when we did something wrong, throwing snowballs at the girls or washing their face with and the girls wouldn't, you know, tell her what we did. So she had a ping pong paddle and bend over and She'd give you about five or six good whacks with the ping pong paddle every time you threw a snowball at one of the girls. God, my ass used to look like a waffle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Really whop you. Oh, yeah. When uh, the sisters had a cabin, now you know where Macaulay Road is, where it hits the east side drive? That log cabin that's hidden behind the trees was the Dominican sisters' uh, cottage. And uh, they would swim at the beach. In their bathing suits, you didn't see any skin. <laughs> they were practically covered head to foot. But uh, many years later, and this is probably 30, 40 years ago, I was up here on a summer vacation, and Don Cole and Donald, or Topper McDonough, and I went down to visit the, the Pop, the nun that was last name. And they were working on that cottage. It had a, it was cedar logs, and there was a lower log that was rotting. And those nuns, three of them, they had hacked and cut, and got that log out, and they were putting a new log in there. They weren't waiting for some man to do it. They, they did it. <laughs> Didn't hire anybody. Oh. And they had a little cooking room off to the side of the cottage, and we sat in there and had a nice visit. I think she's passed away now. She had a sister who was also in the order, but we never knew her. She didn't serve up there. See, the island back in the early part of the 1900s, the community couldn't afford to pay a full staff of lay teachers. So the Bishop of Grand Rapids sent the Dominican nuns up here to teach. And the tradition continued into the uh, early 90s. Yeah. And of course, that's on the mainland, that'd be a real no-no to have a nun in her habit teaching in a public school. Yeah, they taught about 95 years, I think it was, yes. about 95 altogether. But the whole time I went, we had nuns. At, uh, it was public school, but we had nuns. The only place in Michigan that had all nuns in the, in the public school, but they only got, oh, I don't know, about $700 a month, maybe $75 a month salary, was, or 100 at the most. And you couldn't have got lay teachers back then. The tax base here was practically nothing. Yeah. So uh, the athletic program, once a year, the school board would buy us a softball. Oh my goodness. That was it. You had to provide your own bat. If you wanted a glove, you had to have your own glove. Well, them softballs, they were just twined, you know, rolled up with a rubber cover over them. 
they'd last about three games, and then the cover would be off, and then every time you hit it, more and more string would come out. You hit string would be 20 feet behind the ball. So fortunately, one of my cousins, Jerry Lochner, his dad owned the gro where the the uh, community center is now was a grocery store. A gen he had a general store there, so Jerry would keep coming up with more and more softballs. His dad would give him, or one of our parents would buy another softball. The school board would buy one softball a year. That was that was the budget for the athletic department. So uh, we, you know, we got by. We well, we just buy our own softballs and. You wanted a bat, you had to bring your own, or so er, we did, and everyone got by. But, uh, school board didn't spend much money on on the, on the youth, that's for sure. We have here the Highland's best singer, <laughs> but he doesn't have his guitar with him. He won't sing them. now unless he's got his guitar. So. Yeah, yeah, that's right. He's safe. Can I interrupt you for one minute? There are some of his CDs in the back. They're interviewing us. You don't want to interrupt that for a minute. Yeah, no, we're we're pretty much just about that. We're about yeah. finished. Yeah. Okay, just go inside. We'll be All right. Uh, I talked to Mary Lee. Did you? Yeah, she told me that. Got it all resolved? No, I think so. The guy's got to call us back, but I want to get an exact price before we do it. Okay. Yeah, I gotta talk. I haven't talked to him yet. We'll let him be. And then, uh, what else was there then? Okay, that's all I said. You were very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, um, uh, just as one last question. I was wondering if either of you knew anything about the, um, the Doney Gallagher house that we're excavating at? Did you know the people who have lived there ever? Sure. Or, oh, yeah? Sure. Well, the first ones were in 1847, so no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. But you the last family that lived there, uh, the last member, was Peter Gallagher. And they, the family were... Now, was the Doné name from one of their ancestors, the Doné Gallagher's? I don't know. Who we call Peter Doné, that was uh, Mary Early's nephew. The house is owned by Mary Early and her husband, and he died... I never knew him at all. I remember seeing her around, seeing her at church on Sunday and, and elsewhere. And she was about 100 years old, or close to 100, I think, when she died. She very was, old. She was, she was very old. And Peter was her nephew. And so that's why she left the house to him. Well, all of us knew Peter and Dolores. You know, you know, I knew him since I was a kid. And they're both deceased now, although she yeah. didn't die very many years ago. Dolores. No, about two years ago. About two years. Uh, they, what did they do? Well, Peter was born and raised here, and had, they had a farm down on the east side, of this family farm. And then he went to World War II, he World War II, and he came back, and he tried to make a living, as a lot of the guys did, but by then the fishing was gone, so the farmers, the ready-made market in town was gone, as I you know, mentioned earlier. So he left, and he went downstate and worked in the factory, and he did a little bit of farming there. But he worked in the factory. I don't know what he did, but he worked in the factory down there for 30 years or whatever, retired, and then moved back up here, and his aunt left him that house. And uh, instead of the f going out to his family home, well, that burned down sometime later anyway. So it was his family, his parents' home. So that was his aunt's home. Okay. And I never, knew, I never knew Mary Early's husband. He died a lot earlier, but they farmed there, and I think they had the one child. That's what Deborah, I didn't know it, mm -hmm. but Dr. Rotman said that you know, they had, I think she had one son or whatever, but I don't know what happened and there. But Peter had a brother, Lester, that you knew. Now, was there a third brother? Patsy. Oh, Patsy, yeah. I think it was the three, and then they had the one sister, Anna. See, I didn't know her, but Patsy, I remember. Lester used to come up for homecoming. And he'd be dressed with a suit and a pair of two-tone shoes, and he could really—he would do a solo dance if you convinced he him. He was to. probably one of the better dancers there was on Beaver Island. Yeah. He and would, he would have fitted in with one of those Irish dance groups because his feet just pulled. He died about four or five years ago, and my uh, my mother' maiden name was Cunningham. 
she had, I think, nine sisters, and they were known as the Dancing Cunahan Girls, and they all loved to dance, all of them, and there's only the one left now, be my Aunt Anna. She lives down uh, in Wheaton, Illinois, and the year that uh, Lester died, he died like in March or April, and she always would come up for the homecoming, that's always the second weekend in August, she'd always come back up for that, and that year when Lester died, she said, well, I'm not going to come up. She came up in June for a funeral. One of our aunts died, one of her sisters died. She said, well, you come back for homecoming? She says, no, there's no point in it. Lester's dead now. There'd be no point in coming up for homecoming. Oh, she, yeah, she would have come up just to dance with him. You know? And one of her, then she had a brother, Lester, that, that would be Father Dan's dad, was also an excellent dad. He loved to dance. He loved to dance. He was a good dancer. But, and she danced with him too. But with Lester, Do Lester Gallery, Lester Donegander, uh, he was an excellent. Peter was a good dancer too, but Lester loved to dance more apparently, and, and uh, he was very good at it. And so she said, well, there's no point in coming for homecoming because Lester's gone now. So. Did, did Peter farm the old homestead there in the summertime when he'd come up? I don't think so. Okay. He took care of the, he did some grass cutting. Yeah. took care of the cemetery, the lawn, and, and cut grass other people. He oh, would yeah. go all over. He had a trailer. Thing. So, no, I don't think he... He, probably, he had a garden, his yeah. own garden. You know, he didn't farm. I don't think he ever farmed at all. No. Okay. Just beyond where the Sunnyside School was, there's a farmhouse on the left of Rister's family. And uh, one of the ladies, uh, well, one of the sisters, Catherine, She's the last of her family, and she comes up here every summer. But one of her nephews, I believe, Bob, he's the one that has that truck garden I saw on that land today. And he's pretty serious about it, growing vegetables. He plays in our golf league. What? Number one fairway runs parallel to the road. And right across the street is the Donay Gallagher home. So my partner, Frank Solly, hits a mighty drive off the tee on number one, but he slices sometimes. He uses the drive instead of the freeway. And his ball will go up, clear up over the road, and I'll say, there's another one in Peter Donay's field. When I get him to use the freeway, you know, straighten it out. And he still out drives me by 75 minutes. <laughs> and what my dad, what he did for 11 after uh, his dad owned the Shamrock, and he took that over during World War II. And uh, he and the, his brother bought it from Grandpa. And then he went to the Navy in World War II, and then when he came back, his brother bought a grocery store, which was where the Harbor Market is now was the and his grandfather's store, the McCann store, which is where the harbor, or where the uh, community building is now. So that my uncle bought that, then my dad ran the Shamrock for 35 years or whatever. So that's what he did for a living. Bartender. <laughs> did your mother just, you know, raise the kids? Raise the kids. And then, well, they had the motel. They built a motel on the shore up here, the Isle Haven. So mother took care of the motel. We had seven children, seven children. And then you had two more cottages there. Yeah. Well, the most, well, that's, yeah, the one big building and the two yeah. other cottages. Two so the six cottages. So she took care of them. And then he did the shamrock. So that's how we made the living there. Mm -hmm. Nope. That's great. You guys have been very, very helpful. <laughs> Thank you. Well, between us, we have a lot of memories, yeah. but uh, there's certainly a lot more to tell that we can't remember or didn't experience as primarily that. So with all the road traffic here, I don't know how much you picked up. <laughs> <laughs> My mother had this wonderful recall of events past. She would supply the dialogue. I didn't know her to exaggerate, but I think she probably did to some extent. But Tales, the stories, the funny stories, the uh, events, the history. 
community didn't remember that. And our Martin great grandparents, who are buried in the Holy Cross Cemetery, we never knew where they were buried, but she remembered because she used to put flowers on the grave. Well, it's a flat stone on the north side of the old part of the cemetery, and it just says father and mother. So we remember with the headstone. I've been prodding my Martin cousins for four or five years now that to all donate to a common fund and put a proper headstone down. I know my mother told me that a cousin who would, be, would have been her generation was up here for the summer from Chicago and he died of meningitis when he was 17 or 18 years old. And he's buried on that same site. Again, with no market. People didn't have the money. So it didn't have the money. Anything yeah. else? Thank you. Covered everything. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you both. Okay, it's been great. You.